Hi, I'm Piper Thunstrom, senior software engineer at Zapari, where I build web APIs. I'm a community organizer in the Python community, where I've helped run multiple meetup groups and even helped run a conference or two. I'm an open source maintainer of a handful of game libraries, and probably unsurprisingly with that fact, I also make small video games I release on itch with most of the code available on GitHub. If you're going to tweet about this talk, you can tag me at PA Thunstrom. So Python gaming rocks. Python game development is actually approaching something of a rebirth right now, and I want to encourage more folks to dig into the amazing ecosystem. You might be asking, why Python? I graduated from a business program at the local community college and learned to program to use my degree more readily. I started this process by working my way through Al Swigert's inventing games with Python and Pygame. That was my first step to becoming a software engineer and let me fall in love with Python the language. Since then, I've been using Python game development as my sandbox for learning new software-related skills. When I first started freelancing as a web developer, I used a game jam as an opportunity to better understand the idea of an MVC framework and built one from scratch. It was not one of my brightest ideas. I didn't finish the game. Later, I used that same technique when I started speaking at tech conferences, introducing games as a tool for learning. Speaking at conferences around the United States was actually how I fell in love with Python, the community. So let's talk about the rebirth I mentioned. My co-maintainer, Astraluma, started this great website intended to compile the number of resources Python has for game development, and I'd like to briefly go over the information. So let's start with pythongaming.rocks. This website is a high-level overview of a number of game libraries with an eye to where they fit into the ecosystem. From the low-level libraries that give Python developers hardware access and various game engines and frameworks in both the 3D space and 2D space. Plus, some specialized engines for specific genres of game development. It also tries to answer the question of why to use Python instead of another language. The important elements. Python, while historically was a very slow language, and even now in a head-to-head -head performance against machine code, is still slower. But the good news is, it's become performant enough to work for many kinds of game making. The trade-off for the slower execution speed is a language with much more powerful semantics, including type hinting for those who prefer static typing, and a much faster development cycle. All of this makes Python a great choice for small, independent games or rapid prototyping. Combine all of the above with Python's presence as a great language to learn with, and you've got the building blocks of a really solid education curriculum. So let's do the whirlwind tour of the space. In hardware layers, we actually have a bunch of tools. The idea behind calling these hardware layers is that they handle most or all of the native code required for performant games in Python. Some of them include a lot of extra features specific to game making, so don't write these off as just hardware libraries. At the top of the list is Pygame, primarily for the name recognition if nothing else. Pygame is a number of C extensions with its own bindings to SDL on board. It's been around forever and it's released its last 1.x release. The team's entire focus is knocking down Pygame 2 bugs and getting that out the door. Pygame actually includes one of the best access aligned bounding boxing classes I've ever used. Th though I have some complaints about how its properties are named. It also pitches itself as providing a significant amount of control over the game loop. Instead of your code being called by the framework, you call the relevant Pygame methods. I can actually attest to the amount of control available, as early versions of my game engine were built with Pygame as its primary dependency. The big, other big contender at the top of the list is Piglet, which builds itself as a cross-platform windowing and multimedia library. In short, it's for games and things that look like games. Piglet vendors all of its dependencies, so it's actually been really easy to install on most platforms. Its big winning feature is a sprite class that does a lot of the work for you when you're rendering. In more pure hardware access libraries, you have Pi SDL2, which combined with Pi SDL2 DLL can be pip installed on Windows and Mac systems with no additional downloads needed. If you prefer OpenGL, there's Pi OpenGL and Modern GL out there for you. Finally, if you'd rather do something in like VR, Harfeng supports Python scripting. And for mobile applications, there's Kivi. 
From those, we're off to higher level frameworks with plenty of options out there. Panda 3D has been around for longer than I've been talking about game development. It's built in C++, supports both C++ and Python APIs, and focuses on 3D games. I can't say much more about it, except that they claim you can build your first game in 15 minutes, which is actually pretty impressive in the Python game dev world. Most of the other tools are actually improved APIs on top of existing libraries. Starting with the newest of the bunch, Ursina Engine is a 3D engine built on top of Panda 3D. Its focus has been making a more Pythonic API on top of the existing one. Then we've got Arcade, which was built on top of Piglet. Its design was for teaching code as a general thing. And so most of its objects just use the standard Python protocols for the built-in types those objects are most like. One of its biggest wins is built-in physics engine for platformers. Also built on Piglet is Cocos 2D, which has multiple bindings across many languages. If you have experience with Cocos 2D in another language, this might actually be a good place to try for Python game dev. Another tool available is Pygame Zero, which is the Pygame API, but with an additional event loop, which reduces the amount of boilerplate required to get started. It does some magic with its script runner to put the most relevant Pygame and Pygame Zero functions into the global namespace, so you just need to call the functions without import. No discussion of Python game engines is complete without at least mentioning RenPy. It's been around for a very long time, and a number of visual novels have built, been built in it. It uses a custom domain-specific language, but the engine itself is Python. The great thing about this ecosystem is that with the number of projects and developers working in the space, there are now enough choices to satisfy just about everybody's tastes. From loose frameworks to full-fledged engines, great options with all the batteries included, or leaner tools with just a cluster of utility libraries. No matter how you like to code, you've got an option. Now, this tour is missing one contender I care a lot about, and that's my engine, Pursued Pi Bear, or PPB for short. So let's talk about that bet in a bit of detail. So PVB actually started as it, its existence as a minor modification of that Game Jam MVC framework I mentioned earlier. Over time, it shifted, and now PPB is an education-focused game library. On the technical side, it's a 2D sprite-based event-driven engine. We try very hard to be game genre agnostic and want to empower you to pay attention to only the parts you care about. So what does PPB offer to set itself apart? First, PVB has for a long time been a user-centric project. We've identified our core user demographics as learners, educators, and hobbyists. Teachers were the first audience, outside of myself, that we started building for. They saw a new Python game tool and wanted something better than the one they'd been using. I consistently sought out educators' free feedback as I designed the API to allow them to focus on as small or as large of a lesson as they wanted. Students and learners were a natural extension of the teacher's request. To be better for the classroom, we had to be good, a good tool for beginning programmers. We reduced the conceptual complexity of the earliest programs and built the API in a way to neatly hide com that complexity until it was necessary to confront. Our hobbyist focus was twofold. We wanted PPB to grow with learners as they became confident programmers in their own right, and we wanted the software developers that work on PPB to enjoy the work they do. As such, we made sure PPB isn't one set of opinions. The entire system is modular and extensible. You can subclass the various components with confidence, replace defaults when needed, and even rip out which hard back hardware backing you're using and replace it with your own. By identifying these groups, we're in the process of becoming a community-driven project. A few times a year, we hold a semi-open meeting with stakeholders from the core development team and each of our core demographics. Currently, we don't have a lot of students due to them just not being part of the community yet. Uh, this meeting actually helps us plan our long, medium, and short-term goals as a project. The most important selling point, the is that we've picked a stable and useful set of defaults that allow you to start building immediately. We pick a resolution, a set of subsystems that let you handle things like input and sound. Sprites even get default colored blocks with no extra code. 
we want you to be able to build your first rudimentary game in five minutes. I'm going to demonstrate what I mean. First, once you have a functioning environment, you can make a window with two lines of code. Import ppb, ppb.run. If we run this, we get a blank window. In order to start adding objects to it, instead of building a scene with a class, we can actually just give it a function. We're going to make a lambda with it that accepts a scene, scene dot add pbb dot sprite. Now we run this and we have a nice block in the middle of the screen. This isn't actually the most useful thing. So how about we replace our sprite with a default behavior sprite, target sprite. Uh, to do this, we're going to have to import the features package like so from ppb.features, import default sprites. And then we're going to replace the sprite call here with default sprites dot target sprite position equals ppb vector zero, negative nine, And then target equals PPB vector zero twenty. And uh, we need to make sure to invoke this the per correct way. All right. Uh, so as you can see, sprites and PPB can take arbitrary keyword arguments. We set these as values on the sprites. Um, in this case, position and target are both used by the target sprite to move it. So if we hit play, we now have a block that flies straight up the screen. So what about player interaction? Uh, we're actually going to have to make some edits to this as we've been relying on the built-in so far. So first, let's make our, scene, our sprite a class. We're going to call it ship, mostly because I like those for demos. Uh, this is going to continue to be our target sprite. We're going to give it a speed attribute, speed equals of five. And then we need to do an event handler. This is an event, our mouse motion event handler, but all events in PPB follow this pattern. First, the name of the event is turned into on, on and the name of the event at, in snake case. Every handler takes an event and a signal. And if you'd like, we've made it so that you can type hint everything. So we're going to let this know that this is a mouse motion event. So inside this handler, we're going to make self.target equal position event dot position. And then self.facing equals event dot position minus self dot position. Down here in our Lambda, we're going to delete all of this again. And we're going to invoke our ship. So here we go. Hit play again. We now have a block on screen that follows the mouse. And just for fun, let's make this an actual sprite. You can do this by adding a PNG with the same name of your, as your class. So in this example, as you can see, if I add a ship.png and hit play, we now have a ship. Uh, if you notice, its rotation is backwards. Uh, that's actually because currently the default rotation is based on down, so we'll just change the basis to ppb.directions.up. While we're doing this, the other way you can define images is with the image attribute. ppb.image ship.png And now, everything works. So, in about five minutes, we've built a tiny video game. Honestly, 
This is a lot more impressive when I do it live, but I hope I've made my point. As of this recording, we're looking forward to our point 10 release in September 2020, with a roadmap to 1.0 in June 2021. Our focus is in settling the last few experimental APIs, improving the documentation, and adding classroom-ready tutorials to the project. Additionally, our community has started putting out a collection of tools that work with PPB. GitHub user Iron Froggy has released PPB Tween for using animation tweens and PPB Timing, which is a timing subsystem. He also produced the tool Feet, a Python runner that works like Love2D, but for Python. Astraluma, in addition to maintaining PPB with me, also released PPB Mutant, a sprite system that uses the mutant standard emoji to render sprites. Moshe Z released and maintains TXPPB, a twisted integration for PPB. The coolest results of that is integrating a web server into a video game, or more interestingly, embedding a video game you can modify live while it's working in a Jupyter Notebook. I've been releasing various tools such as a behavior tree implementation I, that I currently recall misbehave. So the new world of Python game making is here, and if you've not tried it lately, you should definitely dive right in. Python now has a pile of game libraries that is growing regularly. There's an engine or framework for just about every taste. A lot of us are putting effort into new tools to make the experience even better. Even if you're not wanting to go indie or build games to sell, you can always work on projects for fun or even use game development as your own personal sandbox for learning new concepts in a space that can't possibly break in a way that can hurt. And while you're checking out the language and the tooling, get involved in the community. It's a bit of an unofficial motto, but in Python we like to say, come for the language, stay for the community. And to get you started, come join the PPB Discord. Help us out by putting our little library through its paces. There's a link on this slide, and I'll see you in the Q&A.